Welcome everybody to today's webinar by the IEA SSC Solar Academy and hosted by the International Solar Energy Society, ISIS. We are very pleased to have all of you here and we're going to get started now. My name is Arabella. I am the Congress Communications and Outreach Officer here at the ISIS HQ in Freiburg, Germany. And I'm going to give you a short introduction into ISIS and the work we do as we have many new participants joining us on the webinar today. The International Solar Energy Society, ISIS, is a non-profit UN accredited membership NGO. Our vision is 100% renewable energy for all, used efficiently and wisely. ISIS represents a diverse membership of academics, researchers, energy practitioners, consultants, students, businesses and advocates. ISIS works together with like-minded organizations from countries all around the world to advance the renewable energy transformation. There are many benefits to joining ISIS and you can always find more on our homepage. Some of the benefits are the exclusive access to presentations and webinar recordings such as today's in the ISIS webinar archive. ISIS members can also get discounts and even free registration to ISIS events and partner events. Every month ISIS publishes a newsletter for our members where you can follow our progress and share your news. Members can also subscribe to our academic journal Solar Energy, our flagship publication at a reduced price. And in the ISIS online bookshop, ISIS members qualify for reduced prices on the different publications. So we welcome those who are not yet members to join to today to support our work. For those of you who are already a member, we thank you for your support. And as a special benefit to all attendees of today's webinar, we are very happy to offer a special discount when signing up with ISIS as a member within the next two weeks. All attendees will receive a 20% discount code over the next few days. And if you sign up, the discount code will apply. Now, some brief information on the webinar for today before we get started. The webinar will present three presentations and it will be moderated by Pedro Diaz. And we will have a Q&A session at the very end. So if you wanna send in your questions, you can start sending them in right away throughout the presentations. And then we will have one cumulative Q&A session at the end. And I'm now happy to introduce you to our moderator for today, Pedro. Pedro is the Secretary General of Solar Heat Europe, and he holds a management degree from the IPVC and has extensive experience in both the private and the non-governmental sector. In his previous field of work, Pedro focused on the heating sector and there more specifically in gas retail and the commercialization of heating equipment. I am now happy to hand over to Pedro. Pedro, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction, Arabella, and uh, thanks to ISIS also for the opportunity to cooperate with this webinar uh, once again. So uh, it's a successful event that we are happy to, to cooperate uh, on a yearly basis. So my name is Pedro Diaz. I represent Solar Heat Europe. Uh, many of you might uh, know uh, as ESTIPS, the European Solar Thermal Industry Federation, but we've already uh, some years now we have renamed into Solar Heat Europe. So we are the trade association representing the solid and cooling sector uh, in Europe. Um, I'm, I'm very happy about cooperating with this webinar and the topic we have. And we have uh, three outstanding speakers, as you know, uh, Werner Weiss, Berger Lepp and Harald Druck. Um, the webinar is foreseen to take one hour and a half, as you know. Uh, the introduction presentations will uh, last uh, approximately one hour. And then we have half an hour for the Q&A section. Um, you can type your questions anytime uh, under the question box. And uh, um, please note that this will be addressed at the end uh, 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 during the period dedicated to the Q&A. So without further ado, uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Um, that will start with an introduction about the IEA Solid and Cooling uh, Program uh, and its Solar Academy, and then proceed for this presentation about the new edition of the solar heat or light. So this first speaker is Werner Weiss. Uh, Werner is one of the most reputed experts in our sector. Uh, it has been for me a pleasure to, to work with Werner with, uh, for, for many years now um, in the European ET and cooling uh, uh, technology platform, um, but also um, in his quality of uh, uh, founding member of the AE Intech. Um, in Gleisdorf, um, and uh, many of you know that also Werner has been working for a long time uh, at national international level so thermal and energy efficiency projects uh, since the, the 80s. 
and uh, in particular, and with relevance also for the for the presentation today, uh, Werner is a co-author of the Solar Heat Worldwide uh, uh, report, and will later present us some of the findings. So, Werner, welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Pedro, for the nice introduction. Um, just a second, I will show my presentation. Uh, so can you see it on the screen? Yes, we do. Okay, thank you for this feedback. Yeah, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are. Um, before I start my presentation, I will give you a short introduction of the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Technology Collaboration Program. This is one of the IEA research and development uh, programs already established in 1977. So the solar heating and cooling program was one of the first research corporations within the International Energy Agency. Currently, we have 19 member countries and the European Commission and eight international organizations. Uh, at the moment, we are running eight projects, so-called tasks, on a very broad range of topics starting from renovating historic buildings uh, over solar water management, solar process heat, solar cooling for the sun belt, and it goes as far as daylight and electric lighting. About 300 plus experts worldwide work together in these eight running projects at the moment. What you can see here on the map, uh, the countries highlighted in yellow are the direct country members and the eight uh, sponsors are highlighted in this brown, uh, brown color. And it's mainly representing the UNIDO uh, uh, centers for energy efficiency and renewable energy. So it's really a worldwide network. And four years ago, we, uh, we decided to establish this solar academy because we wanted to transfer uh, the knowledge gained in these tasks to the outside world or the inter interested uh, public. So what we do is we organize these webinars held quarterly and hosted by ISIS. As you know, the today's webinar is on solar heating and cooling markets and industry trends, but we do it, as it mentioned, above its quarterly to different uh, task results. Further on, we produce videos, interviews with solar experts, and of course, all the past Solar Academy webinars are available on the website. Last but not least, we organize on-site and online trainings. These are training workshops on specific solar thermal topics, uh, and they are provided by the IA SHC experts. So that means if a new country, a member country, uh, is interested in a topic or the results, you even go to this country with experts and do this training on site. Uh, past trainings we had in the Caribbean, we had in, in China, in South Africa, and the UK. And this will be done uh, upon request of the member countries. So this is basically what's the background of the Solar Academy. Here you can find more information. Just visit our website or follow us on social media. And if you have questions concerning how to join the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Program, the best way is to get in contact with our secretariat. You can see the email address here. And at the end of the webinar, you should get also our slides so you can uh, see all these contact details. This brings me to my presentation of today. Um, as it was mentioned several times already, today we focus on solar heating and cooling markets and industry trends. And at the same time, we launch the Solar Heat Worldwide Report. So the content of my presentation now, you will be, uh, it will be possible to download it after this webinar from the website, which is highlighted in red letters on the bottom of this slide. You can download this a quite comprehensive report of about 90 pages. So I will not be uh, able to present everything what we have in this report, uh, but I will show you the 
main highlights of the report of the edition 2021. So what's in this Solar Heat Worldwide report, we have the global market development and trends in 2020, and we have very detailed market, market figures from the year 2019 from 68 countries. So if you're interested in particular on data of installed uh, capacity, square meter of different collector types, you just uh, go in detail in this report. Uh, we published this report already since the year 2005, so we have really long time series. And uh, my co-author, Monica spurk dürr and I do it together uh, on behalf of the IEA Solar Heating and Cooling Program. This brings me to the solar thermal capacity in operation and annual energy yields. You can see here what we have achieved in the period between the year 2000 and 2020. You can see we started uh, with about 62 gigawatt installed capacity in 2020 and in, uh, sorry, in the year 2000. And in 2020, we reached 501 gigawatt hour gigawatt installed capacity. So significant growth and the annual solar yields related to this installed capacity grew from 51 terawatt hours in the year 2000 to 407 terawatt hours in 2020. Um, nevertheless, I have to mention here at this point that the year 2000, uh, 2020 showed uh, a market decrease compared to 2019 of 4%. This is mainly due to the reason that China had a market decline of about minus 3% uh, in the year 2020, but also strong European countries like Greece and Poland had unfortunately uh, shrinking markets. But we have also good news. We have here, on the contrary, to the worldwide trend dominated by the huge Chinese market. Uh, we have uh, countries with the highest growth rates in 2020, where Germany with spectacular nearly 26% growth rate but also Brazil, Cyprus, the Netherlands, Turkey, the Palestinian territories, and Portugal showed significant growth rates in 2020. Before I go in more detail, I show you the top three markets for different applications. Just a quick overview. Uh, if you look on the top line, it's the solar district heating. We had the top countries concerning new additions in 2020 was Germany took over from Denmark. So for years, Denmark was leading this market, but in 2020, Germany took the lead ahead of Denmark and China. If you look to solar industrial heat, the new additions came mainly in China, Mexico, and Germany. Concerning swimming pool heating, the most new additions were in the US, followed by Brazil and Australia. And then we have two applications where we show the total in operation. Uh, systems or square meter. Uh, it's solar air heating systems, mainly used for space heating, but also for crop drying. It's in, in Canada, Australia, and Japan. And last but not least, an interesting new market from the last years is this PVD market, so photovoltaic thermal in operation at end of 2020. France is leading ahead of South Korea and China. So this chart gives you a hopefully a quick overview where we are, where are the leading markets. Still, small-scale solar water heating systems are the dominant market. If you look on the worldwide scale, about 60% of the total market worldwide is on small-scale solar water heating systems. Uh, on the top left, you see these typical pump systems like we have in Europe. And on the bottom right, the typical thermosiphon systems. Uh, especially the, the pumped systems are really very much under pressure for years now from PV and heat pumps. So that's a challenging market. But nevertheless, we have um, an area with consi consistent growth in the megawatt scale systems, mainly in solar district heating, but also in industrial applications and large systems uh, for multiple family houses, public buildings, and so forth. What you can see here on this slide, 
those are the time series starting in the 80s up to 2020. Uh, the bars show you the number of systems in Europe. These are the orange parts and the red parts, the number of systems outside Europe, mainly in China. You can see for years it was dominated by Europe, but in the recent years, a lot of systems were also, in terms of number, installed outside Europe. In total, at the end of 2020, about uh, 470 large scale systems with 1.7 gigawatt corresponding to about 2.4 million square meters were installed in these really large scale markets uh, where the, the biggest subsector is solar district heating, which is shown here on this slide. A lot of you might know Denmark was leading this market for a decade with a total number of 124 systems for solar district heating the capacity of one gigawatt installed capacity. This is followed by China with 18 systems, Germany with 43 systems, but on average smaller collector area per system. Uh, and then we have other European countries uh, and Austria, Saudi Arabia, Sweden, Poland, the Netherlands, and so forth. But you find more detailed information in the overall report. But this is this large scale megawatt uh, sector for district heating. As I mentioned already, Germany uh, took over from Denmark last year uh, and took the lead. 11 of these solar district heating systems, which were installed in Europe in 2020, seven of these 11 were installed in Germany, four in Denmark, two in Austria, and the largest. Uh, solar district heating system in Germany is installed in was installed in 2020 in Ludwigsburg. This is what you see on this slide with a capacity of one megawatt. Another interesting solar district heating system was installed near Geneva with a capacity of just 0.5 megawatt. But why I show it to you, it's uh, made out of high vacuum flat blade collectors which is not so usual, but it has, of course, advantages if you want to produce higher temperature, especially for district heating. Another picture from Lhasa from Tibet in China, a installation with 11,000 square meter flat blade collectors, so an installation of 9.1 uh, megawatt. The second uh, subsector of large scale systems is on large systems for residential, commercial, and public buildings. So as you can see here, these are what we mean here are neighborhoods where they, it's not district heating, it's usually something like block heating or big systems for hospitals, big systems for hotels, and so forth. And this is also a very quick growing subsector in large scale systems. Here, China is leading with about 76 documented systems with about 300,000 square meters installed, followed by Turkey, France, Greece, Latin America, Austria, Switzerland, and Spain, and so forth. You can read it here on this chart. Shows you a little bit of a different market approach compared to the district heating, which is clear, for instance, Turkey and Greece, they don't have so many district heating systems like we have in Central and Northern Europe. But this is a also a quick growing market on these large scale systems for residential, commercial, and public buildings. Just one slide for solar heat for industrial processes, because Babel App will go more in detail on these so-called chip systems. What we have documented so far is about near close to 900 uh, solar heat for industrial processes systems with about 1.1 million square meter collector area, which are in operation. And they range from small scale systems. So what we have in our statistics, starting with 50 square meters up to several hundred thousand square meters and the 100 megawatt sector. Um, and for 111 of these systems, we have detailed information available. So in terms of which type of collector uh, is used in these systems, uh, 
what are the temperatures used and so forth. You find more of this detailed information in the report, but also on the website on this ship database, where you can see here this link to the website. What a lot of you might know, the world's largest ship system is uh, an application in Mira in Oman. It's a thermal capacity of 300 megawatt. It's used for advanced oil recovery. But more on this ship system will be presented by Babel App in a few minutes. This brings me to one of two, in my point of view, quite interesting markets. Uh, it's PVT, photovoltaic thermal systems. What you see here on this slide is the Hilton Hotel in Cape Town. It has an installation of concentrating uh, PVT systems with 103 kilowatt thermal and 17 kilowatt electric in combination with four times 44 kilowatt heat pump. Another type of PVT system is shown here. It's an uncovered PVT in Sao Paulo, in Brazil, also on a hotel, and it covers about 50% of the hot water demand of this hotel and in addition, of course, electricity. Uh, how does this uh, market develop? By the end of 2020, about 1. close to 1.3 million square meter of PVT collector were installed with a capacity of 700 megawatt thermal and about 230 megawatt peak electric. This shows you also the range uh, order of magnitude between thermal and electric. So it's about two to one. So two kilowatt uh, thermal and one kilowatt electric. So it's about the ratio. The vast majority of this collector area was installed in Europe. Out of this 1.3 million, about 700,000 in Europe about 57%, then it's Asia without China, mainly South, or a lot of this in South Korea, China 11%. And if you look on the European market, France is leading with 39%, Germany 9%, and the Netherlands with 5%. And we have a constant growth rate, annual growth rate of about 9% annually, which is quite interesting, so a stable growth rate about 60%, that might be interesting as well, 60% of these collectors, the PVT collectors are uncovered PVT, and 37% are air collectors, where the hot air is used as a source for the heat pump. So very often the systems are a combination of PVT and heat pump. And you can see here the market development in the different economic regions. An interesting, uh, development we observed, especially in South Africa, was what we call PV to heat systems. So that's the PV panels are directly connected to electric heater in the tank. So very simple system without inverter, so direct AC, uh, sorry, DC current directly heats up the hot water. So the, the electricity is used for nothing else, just for the hot water preparation. And this, with this very simple approach, it's a strong competition in my point of view to normal thermal siphon system. What's interesting in South Africa, this is the development of uh, with the last three years. We can see it started with about 4,000 systems per year, and we are now in the range of 12,000 12, systems already installed by the end of 2020. So it might be an interesting development to follow. Last but not least, I want to show you, of course, you find in, in our report, again, where are the top countries in terms of accumulated collectors. I think most of you know, China is leading, it's by far the biggest market worldwide. And the different colors show you here, the different types of collector. So in China, there's the dominance of evacuated tube collectors. If you compare it to Germany, for instance, uh, here on the fourth place is flat blade collectors, the dominating market. So you get also an idea where are the markets. You can find it also per inhabitant because the total capacity always shows yeah, the, the biggest markets, but per inhabitant, you see something, you learn something about the market penetration. 
And this gives you a completely different picture. Here's Barbados is ahead, is leading worldwide ahead of Cyprus, Austria, Israel, Greece, and so forth. Last but not least, uh, the distribution by type of systems of newly installed glazed collectors in 2019. I want to draw your attention just on the very the right bar. You can see 65% of the newly installed systems were pumped systems and about 35% were thermosiphon systems. If you look back about 10 years, we had exactly the opposite picture where we had about 60% thermosiphon uh, and 30% pumped systems. This is a, due to a major change, especially also in China. Um, environmental effects and the contribution to the climate goals with this 407 terawatt hours produced solar yields, we avoid 141 million tons of CO2. And this relates to 3.8 times the CO2 emissions of Switzerland. So you have an order of magnitude. With this, I thank you for your attention. If you're interested in more details, just visit the website of the IAEA Solar Heating and Cooling Program and download the report. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Werner. So very interesting. Um, so you provided us an overview of the evolution in different segments, uh, such as large scale systems and other, and other segments such as PVT. Um, so I, I'm, I'm sure everyone has appreciated uh, that these, together with examples you showed of, example of these such installations from around the world. And it's also very positive to see um, that the, the solar thermal market has recovered uh, in 2020, in particular in comparison with uh, 2019. Uh, moving on, I have to say that uh, uh, being Portuguese, I have also recovered from the defeat uh, against Germany uh, three years, uh, three days ago. So I'm happy to present our two next German speakers. The, the first of which is uh, Berbel Lab. Um, so Berbel is a very uh, uh, well-known journalist. Uh, she's been covering for over 20 years the solar thermal sector. She is the, the founder and managing director of the, the agency Solrico and also the editor for SolarThermalWorld.org. Besides being uh, also an author and collaborator uh, in many different publications and with the particular relevance also for the presentation today, uh, for the solar heating and cooling uh, market industry reports in the REN21 Global Status Report. So myself and, and also Solar Heat Europe, we're happy that we've been cooperating with, uh, with Bearable uh, in several of the uh, interesting initiatives she's been working. And, and uh, in recent years, very much focused also on, on industry and solar heat for industrial processes. So I'm very um, glad and looking forward to the next presentation on the solar heating and cooling in the uh, industry and business trends 2020. So, Bebel, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Pietro. I will also share my screen. I hope all is visible. Yes. Well, okay. So my topic today is solar heating and cooling industry and business trends 2020. Well, interesting. Not moving again. Okay. okay it has moved yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, Maybe it moved. Yeah, I think it's a bit slow at the at the beginning. Sorry for that. Okay. okay. We have done a lot of data gathering in the last uh, months, and they concern two reports. One is the Global Status Report, as Pietro mentioned. The other one is the Renewable Power Generation Cost Report that is annual published by IRENA. The REN21 report on the left is really a nice cooperation with the solar, heat, um, solar heating and cooling program because Werner Weiss and his team contribute a lot of data to this uh, report. And um, I have abstracted uh, the content of it uh, on the Solrico website so that it's easier to find. The IRENA publication was so far a pure electricity driven report. It was sort of the Bible or is the Bible of the, the power cost generation. 
And um, we have succeeded to bring solar heat for the first time into this report. So they start with a chapter on renewable heat and solar thermal is in the focus of it. So I will present some preliminary data from this. You cannot speak about the year 2020 without this little icon on the left, which is called COVID. <laughs> I think uh, Werner already mentioned some of it. We had a lot of postponed investment decisions by commercial clients that influenced markets, especially hotel and industries declined a lot. And we had uh, declining or delays in installation and commissioning of already contracted projects. Uh, the reduction as in all of the added capacities in the global market were minus four only say it this way. So it was a bit smaller than expected. And this has to do with two uh, supportive trends. And I name them here, the higher demand from homeowners who spent more time at home and invested in infrastructure improvements. This was particularly, for example, the case in Brazil and Turkey. And then we have seen um, changes in policy support that had a much greater influence on demand than the pandemic itself. And this is Germany, Netherlands and China, for example. So this is the core result of uh, the REN21 solar heating and cooling chapter. It shows the 20 largest markets, also in terms split additions, not global market, but the additions in 2020 of water collector technology. And um, what happens here is that the, all the markets that were in plus in 2019 to name are Greece, South Africa, Tunisia, Mexico, Spain and India are now in the negative range. And this has really to do by the pandemic, whereas the markets I named before, you see them here, Turkey, Brazil, Germany and Netherlands are fairly nice in the plus. And um, China has done reasonable well with minus three. They had much worse well, declining rates in the past, and it seems that China really recovered in the second half of 2020 from, from you know, the, the big breakdown or lockdown from the beginning of the year, and they had some supportive measures which really brought demand up. This is another outcome of the REN21 uh, uh, well, GATA gathering. We questioned the largest flat plate collector manufacturers on, and we list them on this ranking without X axis because some of the manufacturers are a bit tricky with seeing their absolute figures published. It includes national and international production volumes of these manufacturers. And there is a clear trend observed uh, since several years that the gap widens between China's flat plate sector and the rest of the world. The Chinese manufacturers, the large ones mentioned in this chart, increased production volume by 12% last year, whereas the companies outside China, uh, the total sell, um, sales fell by 9%. And this is even with uh, the nice increase in Germany that um, Werner mentioned and which profited obviously the German manufacturers in this chart. So in China, it seems that there's a huge concentration going on and the large manufacturers are even growing lar well, faster than the market itself. The flat plate collector market itself in China grew by 6% in 2020. And this has to do with bids, you know, like governmental or private housing industry does huge tenders. And these huge tenders can only be answered by a certain number of large manufacturers and the others sort of die out a bit with a decline in the residential small scale market. As you know me, I always like to talk about solar industrial heat and um, the, all the results I'm presenting now are based on a ship uh, supplier world map that we have built up within the solar payback project. You see, uh, this is sort of the legend of the map where you, we find four categories of manufacturers. We have the ones with collector production without or with references and without. And you can search it either by typing in a country or a company name, or you just click on one of the markers, which you see here. They have these colors, as you have seen before. And there's a pop-up window going out where you see, see the number of references, you see um, how much collector area they have installed, but all related to ship. They might have other, you know, large-scale systems in other applications, but we only count ship. And if there is, we also have a link to the ship-plants.info website uh, that Werner mentioned, where particular plants are listed. 
This is uh, the group of companies which is currently on the world map. This world map is annually updated. So only companies that responded to our survey remain on the world map another year. So we had to remove a lot of them, but we constantly get new ones as well. We have now 75 turnkey ship suppliers listed. Of these, 67 have their own production of collectors. And you see the, the distribution on the right. We have an increase, we have observed an increase of um, concentrating collector manufacturers over the last years. We have now 15 parabolic draft, six Fresnel, uh, four times dish and two heliostats. So this is 27 and this is really an increase um, in current years. All these companies together, the 75, are responsible for 1,000 um, turnkey ship systems. There are a, small, a few smaller ones included below 50 square meter, which doesn't count to our international statistics. That's why it's a bit of a different database than what Werner Weiss was saying. These are the turnkey suppliers with more than 10 references. And you see clearly that the hubs of this industry are in Mexico, in China, and in Germany. And you see that these manufacturers have a big variety of collectors. So you find them with parabolics, you find them with dish, with vacuum tubes, with flat plate collectors. So what makes the manufacturers from Mexico so successful? There are three of them in this ranking and they all together have already installed 188 ship systems. And to answer this question, we can look into the cost assessment that I mentioned at the beginning from, with IRENA. And this is one of these curves or, well, pump, uh, point curve that um, IRENA publishes from based on a database, which is now filled with 109 projects from Mexico, five suppliers contributed cost data, and um, 74 of them are ship plants. The rest is central hot water. You have stationary and concentrating collectors mentioned. And you see that uh, the Mexican market, even it was already a, a mature market, declined costs, which is the left-hand side. You see weighted average installed cost by US dollar per kilowatt. You decline, this declined over the period of 10 years by 17%, which is a nice rate. And the liberalized cost of heat, which are shown on the right-hand side, even declined further. So there was some maturity in yield or some improvements in yield um, by using better technologies. All in all, the 2020 figure on liberalized cost of heat is four US, um, US cent per kilowatt hour, which is a very competitive price and makes clear why Mexico is very strong in doing these commercial plants. Well, the world market of ship, I have already mentioned some figures regarding that. We have done four surveys, so this shows you the development 2017 to 2020. The number of ship projects uh, declined year by year from 207 to 74 last year. There's a high fluctuation in the installed capacity each year. This comes uh, because of the Oman project that Werner also mentioned, the largest pro project in ship worldwide, which came in, you know, into force or was uh, commissioned in different phases. And the fluctuation of the figures um, ha mainly comes from India and Mexico. And to make this clear, I have pointed out in the bottom here, the different figures or like the number of systems in this year in the country. So like Mexico did, for example, 2017, 39, then 51, then 26, and now they do only 16. So India started with 22 and they are now at three. So this, this caused a lot of this decline. So the overall market was as active as before, but the, the big, well, the big markets where we started with 2017 declined. In main India, this has to do with the investment program, which uh, stopped in March 2020. So a few more trends. Um, what is a bit alarming that only 15% of the 75 suppliers listed on the world map have completed at least one ship project in 2020. This was 25 companies last year. So I think we have to really stress the fact that ship still needs a focus of uh, policy support to reach higher deployment rates. 
India, we have seen the highest fluctuation, as I mentioned, because of this uh, stop of the policy support. Um, currently, seven companies are listed, but another eight companies used to be part of firmer world maps and dropped and left the business already. And I think we will see this trend if not policy support is increased also in other countries because it's evidence. If it's such a hard business and you can only realize every second uh, year a plant, it's uh, difficult. A new industry cluster have emerged in the United States. We have now six companies listed. The newcomers, you can check them out on the website. Sunvapor, Sulalux and Skyven all um, offer concentrating collectors and this has to do with massive R&D funding in California to develop low-cost concentrating collectors. I want to stop the ship uh, side uh, with a very encouraging result from our survey. We have asked the manufacturers, the interest in green heating solution by multinational corporation, is it growing or not? And 60% agreed or strongly agreed to that. Only a very small portion disagreed. Some were a bit undivided, tend to agree, we left them out. And they also agreed, like more than 40% of them, environmentally consciousness customers increase the pressure on consumer goods manufacturers to reduce their carbon footprint. So it seems that more requests are really coming to the manufacturers, uh, to the suppliers of ship solutions. And we will see in the next years whether this materializes to more systems. Yeah, well, an interesting market that was mentioned by Werner, which really is growing and strong. It's the central hot water system market outside Europe with the leading countries, China, Brazil, Turkey and Mexico. The, the picture on the top is a Brazilian installation where flat plates are on a roof of the high rise buildings. And the bottom one is a typical one from Turkey with a prison. And I would like to know um, or look back into this uh, cost assessment to show you a bit why these systems are so successful. And what we see here now is a bit of a different chart. We have now gathered all projects that we have in the database for a particular country, not looking at a, a, certain, con a certain year, but for the whole period. And um, we have only listed levelized costs of heat. And uh, you see the average line is the weighted average of this levelized cost of feed in a particular country. And below that, the typical, the, the average uh, thermal capacity of the systems. And uh, below that, again, the number of projects and the average yield. yield. So you see that um, the levelized cost of heat in India and Turkey are really cost competitive with even two US dollar, US cent per kilowatt hour. Turkey seems to reach that with a high, uh, high, well, and reasonable economics of scale by having 800 kilowatt as average size of the projects. But India um, probably has smaller projects, but is profiting from a certain share of swimming pool systems in this uh, range of projects. Uh, and they have higher yields because of lower temperatures. You will see a different cost structure in Mexico and India. They have both the same size of uh, systems, you know, so no scaling effects play a role. They also have a bit of the same uh, yields, but they have very different um, um, US dollar per kilowatt values, which have to do with probably labor and other reasons. And China is a bit uh, uh, out of range here because they have a lower yield in their systems. So they reach four um, US dollars per kilowatt hour. These are again preliminary versions of charts. Well, one last uh, short uh, well, introduction of, of trends in solar district heating, which I find really, really interesting. I think that again, solar district heating in Europe, at least, will be a game changer. We see very high interest of policymakers with generous funding opportunities in a lot of numbers of countries, growing numbers of countries. I have listed some here in brackets. And uh, since I cannot go into details, I want to encourage you, if you want to know further, use Solar Thermal World, the filter function, which which you see here, choose a country, choose application district heating, and you will come fairly fast uh, to one of these, uh, you know, latest reports that we made about new fundings, which is really enormous and will bring for sure interesting plants um, all around Europe. We have also competitive prices. The six Danish solar district heating systems in the IRENA database reach 4.5 US dollars per kilowatt hours. The average size is 12 megawatt. 
so a clear scaling economy of scale effect but a, a heat price that we have also seen in the chart before for systems in in mexico and and other countries so it's it's a and this is denmark you know so that's a, and danish sun as well so that's a very good price and there's an interesting trend to be observed. More concentrating collector solutions will be seen in solar district heating in Europe and China. We have some announcements for European larger systems. And China, I want to share with you this crazy installation here. It's a 170,000 square meter parabolic draft field next to an amusement park, 82 megawatt. You see on the left-hand side, what is like a like an airplane <laughs> track or something is the parabolic draft field. It's uh, installed um, in the north of China by the company Inner Mongolia and uh, you find the news already on the website and we will report further on that and this is how it's currently under construction um, they started I think a year ago with the buildings and now in summer they will start the parabolic field this is not so spectacular but a very important message from the IRENA uh, cost reduction uh, assessment. This shows the economics of scale for the district heating plants in the database, which are now 115. They are 97% of them are in Austria, Germany, and Denmark. The huge plant Silkeborg is included in the curve, but not on the chart. And uh, we reach a 14% increase of cost per doubling of plant size. And there are first ideas that this could be also transferred to ship. So this is an important message to policymakers. If we do large, we can uh, for sure bring costs down. So this was it from my side. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Bervel, for this uh, extremely interesting and groundbreaking uh, presentation. Um, I, I would also like very much to, to point out that uh, I think the inclusion of the uh, of solar thermal in the arena's renewable power generation costs uh, report is uh, is an important milestone for the recognition of the, the potential of large uh, scale solar thermal systems. Um, and this would not have been possible without your your commitment and your your tireless dedication. So thank you very much uh, for that on behalf of uh, of our sector. I think I I, I can say that. And uh, um, um, so this leads us to moving on to the next presentation. And uh, I'm I'm particularly happy to introduce our our next speaker, uh, Harold Hook. So. Uh, keeping with football, so in football terms, Harold would be considered a box-to-box a -box player, such as the diversity of, of his skills and the range of, uh, of his activities. Primarily, Harold is the head of the Research and Test Center for Solar Systems and head of R&D at the Institute for Building Energetics, Thermotechnology and uh, Energy Storage, IGTE, uh, which is in, in Stuttgart, so part of the University of Stuttgart in Germany. Um, I personally also have the pleasure of working with Harold as board member of Solarit Europe and in parallel we have also worked on uh, uh, research innovation uh, topics in the in the ETIP as, as with uh, Werner um, but also on certification activities. So Harold is the honorary chair of the Solar Heatmark Network and is currently chair of the Global Certification Network. So and more recently we should also note that has been indicated as operating agents uh, of the newly initiated IASHC Task 66 on solar energy buildings. Therefore, I think it's it's uh, easy to see that uh, Harold is ultimately positioned to tell us about the market growth uh, made in Germany. So, Harold, thank you very much, and uh, uh, it's it's the floor is yours now. So thank you very much for your kind introduction, Pedro. Um, I really feel honored by this. Um, ladies and gentlemen, also a very warm welcome from my side. And I am really happy to tell you about the solar thermal market in Germany because there is a lot of good news to tell. So um, just a short overview what you can expect the next 15 minutes. Um, I would like to give a short introduction to my institute. Um, then 
focus will be on the German solar thermal market, especially on the success factors, but also on a further success story that is to come. And I will also talk a bit about market threats and finally also about quality assurance and product certification and this context also with regard to the global solar certification network and finally some summary and conclusions. As Pedro has already uh, intensively introduced my person, I will not talk that much about myself but about uh, my institute because it's a quite new one in former times it was called ITW I can imagine that at least the ones of you that are in the sector for a longer time know ITW a few years ago we merged with two other institutes and now we are the Institute of Building Energetics Thermal Technology and Energy Storage and we have several activities ranging from solar technology to energy storage, smart city concepts. We also run an accredited test center for solar thermal products and HVAC equipment and some additional activities related to this. So now looking at the long term evolution of the German solar thermal market. What can we see? We can see that uh, in 2008, when a lot of people were talking at that time about peak oil, we reached something which I would like to call peak solar. So this was really a brilliant year with an installed thermal capacity of around 1,500 megawatt. That means 1.5 gigawatt in one year and this corresponds to around 2.1 million square meter and of course everybody thought things will accelerate things will go on like this but what happened was extremely exactly the opposite so the market declined and the market declined for a really long time and this market decline for around 10 years was, according to my assessment, mainly due to extremely attractive PV feed-in tariffs. Because the subsidies on solar thermal, they were there and they were not fundamentally changed. There were some changes in this period, but no fundamental changes. But yeah, the market really went down from year to year because um, the feed-in tariffs for PV were extremely attractive at that time, but now they are reduced or they were continuously reduced. And what is also, I think, from a psychological point of view important, uh, with PV, you were able to earn money because you got money for the feed-in of electricity but with solar thermal, you can only save money. And of course, earning money is more attractive than saving money. Uh, but now things have luckily changed. Uh, Feed-in tariffs are extremely uh, small now. So focus is on self-consumption. That means also not earning money, but just saving money with PV electricity. And um, then um, in, 2019, we really reached the absolute minimum, or as a mathematic uh, guy, I know it's not the absolute minimum because that's here somewhere, it's the relative minimum. So we reached the relative minimum with around half a million square meter of collector area that were installed. And this corresponds to a thermal capacity of around 360 uh, megawatt, which is approximately uh, a quarter of what we had in 2008. But the good thing is things changed. And now we got what Werner already mentioned. We got this increase uh, by 26% from 2000, uh, 
19 to 2020. And 2020, we ended with around uh, 500 megawatt installed capacity corresponding to around uh, 650,000 square meter of newly installed collector area. And the good thing is the success story continues. What is here uh, plotted based, all this data are uh, provided by the two associations that are active in the German solar thermal sector, it's BSW and BDH. And uh, what is plotted here is the sold collector area in the first quarter of the year. And there you can also see that from 2020 to 2021, there is an increase of 23% already achieved. And I think there will be much more to come in the coming quarters of the year. Now the question is, of course, uh, what are the success factors that lead to this turnaround? And um, I think the most uh, important aspect beside the decrease of the feed-in tariffs uh, for PV is that by the end of 2019, a new subsidy scheme was introduced. And this subsidy scheme is extremely attractive because you get around 30% of the eligible costs if a solar thermal system is added to an existing heating system, you get 40% of the investment cost if an old oil boiler is replaced by an efficient gas burner combined with a solar thermal system. And you get even 45% if an old oil boiler is replaced by a renewable heating system. And as renewable heating systems, uh, biomass burners and heat pumps are considered, but to get this 45%, you have to combine them with a solar thermal system. And what is also very important is that this subsidy rates, they are based on the total eligible costs. And these total eligible costs, they nearly cover everything. So, uh, if you are going to install a new heating system or a solar thermal system, and you have to uh, modify your space heating system to be able to operate it at lower temperatures, for example, installing a floor heating system or wall heating system, which is extremely expensive, then these are also considered as eligible costs, where 30% uh, or 45%, depending on the option you choose, is reimbursed by the federal state of Germany. So extreme attractive uh, subsidy scheme at the moment. If we look what types of systems are subsidized by this program, then in, 2000, uh, in 2020, approximately 11,000 systems were subsidized according to this incentive scheme. And 75% of these systems are so-called solar combi systems, providing hot water and space heating. And they have an average collector size of around 11 square meters. So it's a bit small, but anyway, it's a combi system. And 25% approximately are solar hot water systems. And then what is also interesting, because it's a growing market, around 3% of the systems are for so-called solar active houses. This term is also in the subsidy scheme. And solar active houses are houses with solar thermal fractions above 50%. And there we still have 3%. And the market is growing. And what is also interesting is uh, that for 42% uh, or 42% of the newly installed solar thermal systems were combined with a gas burner. But this is also due to the fact that you are 
uh, in general not allowed to install a gas burner only because you have to cover a certain share of your heat demand from renewable sources. So, and this is already nice. It's a success story. And the next success story that will come is related to large scale systems. <clears throat> in this context, large scale means collector areas larger than 1000 square meters. And if we look uh, what we can expect here, then that means based on different scenarios and uh, systems already in preparation, this market will also increase. But what is plotted here is the total installed collector area, so not the annual installed one, but the total uh, installed one is, of course, uh, impressively increasing. And the annual installed one is also increasing uh, by around, or it's not increasing, but uh, approximately around 50,000 square meters of large scale systems are annually installed. Um, and that means, depending on the size of the market, if you assume this 600,000 square meters, or if you go for 1 million square meters, it's in the range of 5 to 10 percent of the total installed collector area in Germany that will be dedicated to large scale systems. So everything is bright, everything is nice, the sun is shining on a blue sky, but I think also some clouds already appear on this sunny sky. And these uh, are the solar obligations. And these solar obligations, I really consider uh, a threat for our market because in many federal states and cities, um, so-called solar obligations are now implemented or are under discussion. But in many cases, these solar obligations, they are de facto PV obligations because they require the installation of PV panels on the roof of new buildings or fundamentally renovated buildings. And of course, such PV obligations, even if they are called solar obligations, they are a kind of killer for solar thermal technology. And I mentioned this because I can imagine that in your city, in your country, this discussion will also pop up about solar obligation. And then please be aware of the threat. And uh, if you are, have the chance to contribute to these discussions, then I recommend to promote technology neutral solution. That means solar obligations requiring the installations of solar thermal systems, PV systems, or a combination of both. Then I think it's a fair competition. So, what is also important is, of course, quality assurance and product certification. And that means that we need high quality products as a key factor for long term market success. And high quality products can be ensured by using only certified products in the contents of incentive programs and it's clear you cannot build an economy for decades on subsidy. That means more and more these incentive programs and subsidy programs will be replaced by legal requirements. But then also it's important that only certified products are considered as eligible. And I recommend to use uh, well-established certification schemes uh, for solar thermal products like Solar Keymark in Europe or SRCC in the US or Golden Sun in China or Watermark in Oceania. And uh, in this context, I would also like to mention the Global Solar Certification Network because it's also resulting from two IEA tasks, Task 43 and 75, uh, performed within the solar heating and cooling program. And there we established this global solar certification network as a cooperation between leading solar thermal industries, certification bodies, and inspection bodies, as well as 
test labs. And this global solar certification network aims to facilitate worldwide cross-border trading of high quality solar thermal products. It helps to avoid retesting and reinspection of production lines. It's especially interesting for manufacturers entering new markets. And the latest news, the Global Solar Certification Network has this spring established an alliance with the Solar Heating Initiative uh, for the global implementation of the Sology label. I think this is also a very important step forward. And by all these measures, we aim at increasing the quality, uh, reducing the costs and get better market and better business. And if you are interested in further information about the Global Solar Certification Network, then go just to gscn.solar. And with this, I come to the end of my presentation. I would like to summarize. If appropriate boundary conditions are provided, solar thermal markets can grow. But this means, and this is really important, that we need fair economic conditions between different renewable energy technologies. In the past, we had the situation that in Germany, PV systems, if you take the feed-in tariffs into account, were subsidized by a factor of 10 more than solar thermal systems. And then I think it's completely clear in which directions the investment goes. So what we need is a fair economic uh, playing field. We need also appropriate legal frameworks. That means real solar obligations and not PV obligations. We also need awareness with regard to investors and users for our technology. We need certified high quality products. We also need skilled and experienced installers and for sure some things more. But then we can make it. And finally, what I think is very important is that no climate neutral energy system without considering the heating and cooling sector will be possible. So it's not all about electrification. And what is also important is that no climate neutral heating and cooling sector without solar thermal energy will make sense. And with this, I thank you for your attention. And I'm also looking very much forward to the Q&A session. Welcome, everybody. I think we are good to go. And so you all just came off the webinar broadcast and you saw all the presentations. And now we are here gathered with the moderator and our presenters to go ahead into our Q&A discussion. And just as a reminder, if you want to submit a question, keep them short and precise and use the chat box for it. Um, the chat box, you can find it on the GoToWebinar panel. Type in your question. Our moderator will then receive them and we can basically get started on the Q&A. So Pedro, our moderator, here you go. Thank you uh, very much, Arabella. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we are happy to, to have these two part sessions so we can reach uh, more participants globally uh, considering the different time zones. Um, so, uh, I'm also glad that we have our panelists with us uh, uh, for this uh, for this second part. Um, I would start uh, with uh, a question to Werner Weiss um, regarding uh, solar cooling. So, the question goes that uh, it is clear that most applications are district heating and hot water applications. I cannot see cooling applications. Um, are there and there is another question, which is: Are there any other solar cooling technologies except solar PV plus compression chillers and solar thermal plus absorption uh, chiller uh, systems? Werner, please. It's just we did we didn't present it in in the webinar the solar cooling part because the, the whole report is about 90 pages so we'll you will find in the report you will find something on on solar cooling as well so it was just not presented we don't ignore it of course but it's basically it's what you mentioned uh most of the solar cooling systems are uh or consist of a solar collector field uh in combination with an absorption chiller and where we see the market is really above in the range of 300 
uh, kilowatt cold, where we run it with, with solar thermal. Below, so the small scale systems, uh, they are unfortunately not really competitive. There is the option to go for PV and electric driven uh, cooling. Uh, in, in 2020, there is not really a big market, at least what we have in our statistics. We got two new uh, cooling systems um, in 2020. There's one with a 2,400 square meter collect, ah, sorry, 3,500 square meter collector area, the cooling capacity of 600, 660 kilowatt. It's a cooling uh, device for an industry in Austria. Another one is a cooling device in Dubai, uh, also uh, so a smaller system with only 700 square meters. So it's a rather small market. And it's, of course, has to do something with, uh, com so to, to make it really competitive to other applications. But I just wanted to mention at the end here, uh, we have a, a new task running just started. Uh, on solar cooling for the sun belt. So if you're interested, just uh, visit our website of the IEA solar heating and cooling program. You'll find a lot more information on this ongoing task. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Werner. Um, interesting uh, insight and also the, the, this comment on, on, the, uh, on the new task. Um, so next session to, to Berbo. Um, how do you ensure reliability of man manufacturer provided data on sales? Well, thanks for this interesting question. Um, I think best is um, if you repeat surveys. So you go back to the manufacturers each year. And if you have other sources of information like export statistics of countries or installed uh, collector area, or even sometimes uh, like you have uh, figures from a, a, wind, um, a glass manufacturer that you can cross check with and this helps you to ask critical questions you know but the the major quality issue is by repeating every year again so you find implausibilities by changing you know stuff in the departments and so on and they suddenly answer differently and so on so that's and competitors talk about others so you can question again so it's an interesting process very good, thank you. Um, so next question is uh, to Harold on the competition uh, with PV systems. So uh, the question is maybe the increasing difficulties to have enough supplies with higher prices for the PV systems, join with environmental reasons, mining, etc. Could in the future provide some equilibrium to the rate PV thermal, um, reducing the importance and need of the obligations. What do you think about this, Harold? Thank you for the question, Pedro. It's a very good question, and I think I could talk for hours <laughs> to answer it, but uh, don't panic, I will not do it. Um, yeah, uh, what I think what is an additional aspect is the fact that also electromobility is getting more and more relevant. And that means uh, even if you have a PV system on the roof, then the excess electricity that is available for uh, to be converted into heat is getting uh, rarer because you can also use the electricity to charge your car. And I think this is also an aspect that has to be taken into account considering the picture as a whole. And um, on the other hand, I think there is also the question about uh, the price of electricity, because as the situation is in Germany at the moment, the feed-in tariffs on PV are quite low. That means for uh, private households, self-consumption is top priority. And uh, if you look at self-consumption uh, to be maximized, then of course you can buy a battery, and then for a typical single family house, depending on the dimensions, you reach around 60% of uh, solar electrical fraction. And then there is a bit of excess electricity, but at the present situation, and this I think is important, um, this ele excess electricity only occurs during the summer period when you have a lot of sun. And then it might be an alternative to, and this is important, solar domestic hot water preparation because uh, it's quite cheap just to 
uh, bioelectric heating element and to convert the excess electricity into heat for, again, hot water preparation. But if your aim is also to go for space heating, then usually in the spring and autumn, and especially in winter, there is not even enough sun to provide the electricity for the household. And that means uh, the real uh, the real application for solar thermal systems combined with PV systems is uh, the combi system application. Uh, that means uh, hot water and space heating. And I think this market, uh, at least based on our analysis, will not change in the near future, as long as the framework conditions are as they are now. No, thanks. And, and if I may add to that, so there was this idea that was created that PV was a good combination with heat pumps, but that was in some countries where there was a net metering system which someone could charge in the summer, let's say, into the grid and take it back in the winter. So at this stage, that in most countries, at least in Europe, is not happening. So you are selling it during the summer uh, at the selling price, which is lower, and then buying it back in the winter at a much higher price. So um that that's uh, created kind of this idea which which i also think it's misleading but as we are on this topic i would ask Werner um about uh, um, a related question uh which is uh, what should solar industry do to catch up with the rapid growth speed of the pv industry Werner, please yeah, I think I think what uh, is still needed, and it's not a new uh, issue, is we need standardization. So I think what makes PV easy to install is a lot of things are standardized, and then on solar thermal, there's a lot of uh, companies, and everybody, every company has its own approach, its own fixing systems, uh, and I think to bring prices down, it's essentially needed to to standardize to to have a uniform approach uh, we need more companies especially in the large scale systems uh, there are, there's more demand than than companies so and it's still in my point of view to to become more international most of the companies work either just in their own country maybe in the neighboring country of course, the export collectors, but as a system approach, this is really missing. And this standardization goes really from small scale thermal siphon systems. They are always uh, impressed or not impressed, astonished when I see how the fixing systems are on, on simple roofs, they're simply not existing and they're drilling holes in, in existing. It's needed to drill holes. So here, improvement is, is needed for, for, from the industry. Uh, site to have a yeah easy to install system in order to bring labor costs down and with this to reduce the cost of the overall system. Okay, and thank you. Oh, yes, go ahead. Might be, uh, what uh, the Tarals field, I think uh, there are still too many systems on the market without any testing. So really low quality systems, especially in the field of thermal siphon systems. This, in my point of view, has to be eliminated. To, but this has to be done on, on governmental level, of course. But this, especially in the, in the countries where we have a big market of thermal siphon systems, really destroys for years the whole market. They're cheap, but they not even work at the beginning or break down in a very short time period. This is one of the biggest obstacle, obstacle in countries with a strong thermal siphon market and no obligation and no uh, import restrictions concerning quality and uh, in, indeed and if i also may may add to that the uh, there is often uh, in some countries the feeling that if they put quality assurance measures they will be promoted imported products uh, against the local ones but the question is quality assurance puts uh, also uh, additional uh, requirements on, on the national one to get better and to better serve the, the, the customers, the clients. So there is a benefit. So it doesn't mean that uh, national uh, production is it will be excluded. They just have to, to step up and provide uh, also better qualities in their own uh, markets. So in the, in the medium to long run, 
uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an added advantage for the consumers in that country, but also for the manufacturers because they, they can also then reach out to other markets besides their own. Um, to be, uh, what is important is a high quality system is not double the price of a low quality system. It might be 10, 20% price difference. And what yeah. we really saw in our projects, uh, as simple as this, poor people cannot uh, they, they, they cannot afford uh, cheap stuff. It sounds strange, but if they, they put money aside, buy a solar water heater, and then it breaks down after one year, they have not the money aside to buy a new one. So, and if it's 10, 20% higher, and they, they run for 20 years, this is the, the direction we have to go. And this is on the market, it's no problem at all. It's just with others as well. So. And I fully agree, and I would also like to address this topic again, because I also mentioned it in my presentation at the end, what I think what is really important is uh, products with a minimum quality, and this can be ensured by only using certified products. And this is why we also have established a global solar certification network in order to harmonize these different certification procedures that exist on the globe. But um, yeah, again, please, if you go for solar thermal products, either uh, if you are a consumer or if you are in the government uh, at a decision making uh, position, please only go for certified products. I think this is really important. Thank you. Um, so next uh, question to Berbel App and we move back to large uh, scale systems. So, uh, Berbel, in, in Europe, what is the levelized cost of heat for ship systems, for solar heat for industrial uh, processes, with uh, concentrated solar thermal, like uh, parabolic trough or Fresnel? Ah, we have um, only, um, well, we have started to assess also concentrating collector projects, uh, but as you all know, they are fairly few still, especially in Europe. I think there will be more coming. It's a real trend. Um, the advantage of concentrating uh, collectors also in large scale is that you can um, uh, avoid overheating by defocusing the mirrors, and this is um, in larger fields often not the case, so you might have, you know, overheating in fields. Um, we are very at the beginning of the costs and um, we have to say that for Europe itself we cannot give a levelized cost of heat. So um, in, uh, we have looked into um, projects that were installed with European collector technologies in Europe plus outside Europe and I think we found something like um, 89 uh, euro per megawatt hour and uh, but this is out of my head now this is not uh, i have well maybe the person contacts me later on because it was not in my presentation um but uh, we have found very low uh, well the lowest uh, prices we found was in mexico which have concentrating collectors and um, very cost effective ones okay thank you very much we have um, um... Another interesting question, and, and this, I think it will be uh, uh, interesting to, to have the view from the three of you. So the question is, what do you expect will be the likely uh, changes in the market to 2030? Which uses, technologies will decrease and which will increase? Uh, and in addition, will electrification dominate or sit alongside solar thermal systems? So I would say maybe starting with Werner. Yeah, it's, it, it's always hard to predict, predict the future. Uh, I, in my point of view, I'm, I mentioned it in my presentation, the small scale systems are really under pressure for years now. Uh, this relates to the small scale pump systems, but also the thermosiphon system, they are really under pressure from PV and heat pumps. So to, I think this might change. Uh, but uh, as Pedro, as you mentioned, there's the question how far the electrification can go. If we have to replace all the heating systems, all oil, gas, coal, whatever, by electricity, all cars will run on electricity. So is there 100% electrification of, the, of everything possible? So therefore, 
I think it's what I just mentioned before. It's needed for the small scale system uh, to have a significant market share or to keep it, uh, to bring the prices down. This is essential to keep it. Otherwise, I think there is really the danger that the small systems lose uh, in market share. It's on the contrary, I see a big future uh, in medium to large scale systems, solar thermal. There we have the economy of scale, of course, and especially solar district heating allows immediately to switch from a fossil fuel based uh, district heating system to a renewable. And of course, there will be the different uh, combinations. So system integration, this will play a major role. It's not one technology will play the role. So here I see the combination of solar th peak solar thermal systems in combination uh, with heat pumps, high temperature heat pumps, in order to, to use the, the storage volume better than if you use it just for, this, uh, for the district heating as such. So to elevate the temperature level again. So in summary, small scale challenging. Something has to be done here really from the, from the industry point of view to bring the prices down. Um, and large scale, I see there is really a lot of opportunities. Thank you very much, uh, Berbal, on the on the same topic. So, uh, I, well, I think I'm I think I'm absolutely okay with Werner. I just want to add one aspect, um, which might be interested in um, solar district heating, that biomass is much more under pressure. You know, we have seen like the case in Sweden where biomass is uh, today used like 80% and the renewable, it's a renewable district heating grid they have there. But this is completely, this this view on biomass has completely changed. And this is something where we will see a lot of effects because if you do renewable programs today to support renewable district heating, biomass has not this uh, reputation anymore of being sustainable. So then you come much faster to solar because biomass is often was, you know, often a cheaper fuel and also available in big halls. You know, you can, you can, you don't, you're not depending on this, the the irradiation curves of the season because you store it. But um, as, it, as it is uh, a lot of competition in terms of, uh, you know, using area either for food or for, you know, for biofuels and, and also you have to fuel your cars with something. So that, that is an interesting game. And um, I see a lot uh, moving in the international reports on, you know, reducing the, the, well, the potential of biofuels and biomass. So that will influence, and it's also what Vanna said, that will give us a large, a better chance and a better standing in, in large solar district heating, for example. Thank you. Um, Harald? Yeah, uh, in principle, I also share the opinion of my colleagues, but I would like to add an additional aspect. And uh, as maybe all of us, we are in the business for decades. And what I have learned is that all depends on policy. So I think the technology is available uh, both for solar thermal, for PV, for green hydrogen, for electricity. We have the technology ready, but uh, what technology will succeed or how the technology mix will look in the future depends on the political framework conditions. And uh, so this, I think, is for me the important aspect. And I think the only thing we could do as our sector is to lobby for solar thermal, to lobby for heat. Uh, just a few examples. Um, I personally do not at all believe in this uh, all electrification, at least not until 2030, because these are 10 years. And if you look what we have achieved in Germany in 20 or 30 years, then it's around, uh, around 400 terawatt hours per year of green electricity in, again, 20 to 30 years. And what we need for all electric scenario is around uh, 1,200 terawatt hours uh, of green electricity. And this to achieve in 10 years is completely impossible. But again, all depends on policy. And just to give you one example, that is also, according to my opinion, a threat. Now, uh, I would say a few years ago, at least German policy discovered hydrogen. 
Um, and they noticed that energy can also be transferred by molecules and not only by electrons. And now there is a hype of hydrogen. But what is fact is that the share of green hydrogen that is available and that is available to be produced in the country because you need a lot of electricity is extremely low. And anyway, hydrogen is promoted at the moment. And the question is, for example, will there is promotion go on? Will there be this uh, gray hydrogen? Will there be this blue hydrogen that causes a lot of additional CO2 emissions or will it be really green hydrogen? And for me, uh, the same example can be observed with electric cars. The largest market for electric cars is in China. And China is the country or one of the countries with the highest CO2 emissions per kilowatt hour electricity. So from an ecological point of view, it's completely nonsense to go for electric cars in China. But anyway, it's done and it's a political decision. And so I would say uh, all is about policy and we can only lobby for our technology and for it. Thank you, uh, Harold. Um, I, it's in going beyond 2030, uh, there has been uh, released uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, by IEA, the, their net zero by 2050 analysis, which has been uh, quite a, an important report and I would say groundbreaking and, and, and raising a lot of discussion and uh, to, and, and, and it gives, a, 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 it has a good uh, analysis on the heating sector, an interesting analysis on the heating sector. And there they say that uh, uh, direct renewable heat will do 40% of the entire need for buildings and that two thirds of this increase will come from solar thermal and geothermal. So uh, it's clear that uh, solar thermal will be part of the solution. And, and I can give another example from the same report. So they foresee that by uh, 2050 again, so beyond 2030, there will be 200 million households with PV and 1.2 billion with solar thermal. So that is quite a, 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 a big difference and uh, and clearly the it's seen that when we uh, um, design a path towards the carbonization 2050, solar thermal uh, has to be part of the of the solution. I would uh, um, go into um, another question. Um, in this case on uh, PVT, and we are getting to the end of our session, so I think I only have time for one more question for each uh, uh, speaker. Um, so this is on PVT and it's for Harold. Um, so uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of PVT compared with the PV to heat? Mm, um, yeah, I think PVT is for sure one of the promising technologies. That's clear for me. And uh, the main advantage is that if you have an appropriate PVT system, the overall energy output, that means electricity and heat per square meter collector area is higher than if you have two separate systems. Um, so, and especially if we look at cities where there is a limitation in available space, it's uh, a very interesting technology. Disadvantage is of course that uh, on one hand, you need high temperatures for solar thermal, for hot water preparation and space heating. And on the other hand, if you go for high temperatures, then usually this has a negative influence on the efficiency of the PV part. Um, that I would consider as a disadvantage, but I think there is uh, room for innovations. And what I think what would also be excellent is if there would be systems available or collectors, PVT collectors available, where you can adjust between the share of heat and electricity being produced. Uh, because then you could also adapt it to the needs of the customer, uh, depending, for example, on the season. So this, um, I think there is still, of course, also a place and need for research. And compared with uh, PV to heat, I think uh, the disadvantage, or if you compare PVT with PV to heat, then the question is how you do PV to heat. If you do PV to heat just with an electrical heating element, then it's clear that the disadvantage of PV to heat with an electrical heating element is the low efficiency compared to PVT. If you do it PV to heat combined with a heat pump, 
then uh, of course the investment costs are higher. Uh, that's I think the fact. Um, so yeah, but I think there is room for both. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm not sure we still have uh, Werner. If we still have Werner with us, uh, there is a question um, for for Berbel, um regarding also the the Arena uh, report uh, on on costs, which is uh, quite important and and really uh, um, relevant for solar thermal to be included there. And I think in relation to that, uh, the question is if you think that we can get PVT into next year's IRENA report? In terms of costs? Um, I, I assume that uh, the, the cost <laughs> report, yes. This is the cost report. Um, <clears throat> I can only say that I did one and a half years, I spent one and a half years to gathering data on solar commercial and industrial heat. And it was a great commitment by the industry, um, by our sector players to contribute. Uh, PVT is a much uh, earlier technology. And uh, I would assume that um, it might work. If somebody has one and a half years and a good sponsor sponsoring and start they they should start whoever wants to do that start immediately and you can contact me i have a lot of experience how it works you need clear ndas um, it's only the way to go via the industry because you know there is hardly any information publicly available so you have to the manufacturers need to trust you to give you this uh, well a bit delicate uh, business internal figures um, and have good nerves, long time, good financing, and you can do it. Very good. Thank you very much. So uh, we get to the end of our time for this uh, uh, special Q&A session. So I want to thank uh, the speakers, not only for the presentations in the previous session, but also for the availability and, uh, and again, their, their invited answers uh, in this. Uh, um, and to thank... Uh, uh, ISIS and IEA for this, IESHC for uh, the Solar Academy for this uh, initiative. Um, <clears throat> I also thank all the participants um, and uh, for your uh, engagement and your questions. And with this, um, I would like to give the floor back to, to Arabella. So thank you, everyone, and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thanks. Thank you, Pedro, and thank you a lot to our speakers um, for this really very lively discussion over the last half an hour. So we're going to end the webinar now for today. Um, of course, there will be a recording of the webinar, and it's going to be available both on the ISIS as well as the IEA HSC Solar Academy homepage. You need to give us a few days for, for us to get that edited, but then it's going to be available to you. And for ISIS members on this call, you already have unlimited access to all ISIS past webinars on, on the ISIS webinar archive. So go and check that one out, it's still there. And I think we go back all the way until at least 2015, so quite a while now. And with that, there's one final announcement I'd like to make, and that is that in October, ISIS is gonna hold this year's ISIS Solar World Congress. And we are very pleased to have also the SHC uh, program there as our key partner on the program, uh, on the Congress, sorry. And so registration is going to open in July for the Congress. And I think I, I trust to see many of our speakers there again. And I hope to see many of you on the call there as well, joining us in even more lively discussions for an entire week. So I think with that, we close for today. Those are my final announcements. Um, there's going to be a little survey sent to you, and we would appreciate if you could fill that out for us. This helps us to make these webinars even better. Um, yeah, and so with that, uh, Thank you to everybody who's, who joined us today and have a good rest of your day. And I hope to see everybody soon again. Bye.